very strange. But it looks as if I'm not who I thought I were. I really don't know what to make of it. You see, as a birthday present, my partner, Alison, bought me a DNA test from a company called MyAncestry.com. I returned their swabs in the post, and this morning I received the results. It turns out I'm 49% Scandinavian and only 15% English, which is really odd because my brother Mark had the same test last year, and he's about 90% English. I remember we joked at the time how his ancestry were really boring, but apparently most English people are the same. They say if your maternal grandmother were born in England, the chances are your ancestors would have been here for thousands of years. You'd have thought the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings and the Normans and the rest would have all left their mark, but no, apparently not. Perhaps they didn't come over in big enough numbers or maybe their genes were diluted over the centuries. So your average English DNA is more or less the same as the ancient Britons who'd lived here for thousands of years when the Romans turned up. It turns out we're all much the same as the folk who built Stonehenge and every circle. So we shouldn't have been surprised about Mark's DNA. When you think about it, both sides of my family have lived in the same neck of the woods for centuries. Dad's brother, Uncle Ralph, is really interested in genealogy and he's traced the family back to the mid-14th century. The oldest ancestor he could find lived in a village less than 10 miles from here. It's probably much the same on Mum's side. I suppose you could say we're rooted. Or to put it another way, we're a family of stick in the muds. <laughs> Mark suggested my Scandinavian blood might be the result of a liaison between one of our ancestors and a bloke with a horned helmet during a Club 1830 rape and pillage tour of the north of England about 1200 years ago. But that wouldn't make any sense. I checked with myancestry.com and apparently to have 49% Scandinavian DNA, that liaison with a Viking must have been with our mum. Which is a bit of a shock. Frankly, butter wouldn't melt in her mouth. She's the last person you'd suspect of a dalliance. But now I come to think of it, I don't much resemble my dad or anyone else in his family and I'm beginning to understand why. <laughs> This is a really big deal. It's going to take a while for all the implications to sink in. To come to terms with the fact that, well, my dad isn't my dad. Or at least not my biological dad. It's a lot to get my head round. It's probably too early to say, but I don't think it will make us any less close. Or well, not that we're particularly close anyway. To be honest, dad's not an easy person to love. Mind you, at least I'm still talking to him, unlike Mark. I've always been daddy's little girl. It helps he never had high expectations for me. I know he was surprised when I went to uni. I studied politics and history and I'm doing my doctorate now. But Mark has always been a big disappointment to dad, which is really unfair. You see, dad's this macho, ultra-competitive, sporting type of man and Mark just isn't like that at all. They're chalk and cheese. Mark's sensitive, creative, intellectual, and dad is just the opposite in every department. From what I've heard, he was a terrible bully at school, which is hardly surprising when you see how he treats mum. Nothing physical, mind. He just controls her like he used to control us when we lived at home. I really don't know how mum puts up with it. Dad makes all the important decisions and he definitely treats women like second-class citizens. It's about time he realised he's living in the 21st century. I told him that once. He said he's barely come to terms with the 20th, never mind the 21st. Of course I'm not going to tell Dad or Mum about this DNA thing. Mark won't say anything either. He's actually quite jealous. He said he wouldn't mind discovering that he wasn't dad's son, which is sad, really. I must admit, there is part of me that's actually quite pleased, but that's nothing to do with dad. 
You see, in the last five years, I've actually come to despise this country and everything it stands for. I'm actually ashamed to be British and I know it sounds extreme, but I just can't help it. I never used to feel this way. I used to be quite patriotic. I'd wave my little union flag watching the last night of the proms. I was out in the street with the rest of the town when the Queen visited a few years back. I thought there was a lot to be proud of, like how this country was the first parliamentary democracy and, uh, well, the first to abolish slavery and the welfare state and the NHS and thoughts for women and so on. I was proud that so many positive things about the modern world started right here in England. I was proud to share the same nationality as William Wilberforce and Mary Wollstonecroft as um, Newton and Darwin as Lenin and, and Bowie as Shakespeare, Jane Austen and Brontes. <laughs> Well, now I come to think of it, I have no right to take pride in the achievements of others. I'll never win a Nobel Prize or create a new vaccine. I didn't write Hamlet or Wuthering Heights. I've personally done nothing for the rights of women or anyone else for that matter. Just because I share the same nationality as those heroes, it's no credit to me. No more than I should feel ashamed to belong to the same nationality as... Um, Dr Shipman or Jimmy Savile. And yet I do feel ashamed to belong to the same nationality as Nigel Farage. The truth is I'm ashamed to belong to the same species. But that's because the likes of Savile and Shipman are aberrations. They're not representative of being British but the 2016 referendum proved that a very high proportion of us are just like Farage. In other words, small-minded bigots full of fear and hatred for anyone who's in any way different to ourselves. For a lot of British people Farage is the best thing since sliced bread but I find his views utterly repugnant. I know everyone who voted Lee weren't as detestable as Farage but some were just too stupid to realise they were being lied to. I'm sure a lot of them regret voting Leave now we can see all the consequences but there is no hope for the enthusiastic Brexiteers. Those who even now think they did the right thing. If you get into a conversation with any of them, it's not long before you realise you're talking to a racist. You only have to scratch the surface. <laughs> I know they pretend it was all about sovereignty, but that's a load of bollocks. They had no idea which rules came from the EU or how few there really were or why we needed the rules in the first place to be a part of the single market and all that. And I've no patience for those who complain they were lied to. It were blindingly obvious the only ones who'd really benefit from Brexit were the filthy rich press barons and the greedy billionaires. It stands to reason they didn't want the EU scrutinising their ill-gotten gains. Just as it was as plain as the nose on your face, the rest of us would lose out big time in all sorts of ways. So we were lied to, there's no question about that. And enough idiots believe the lies to skew the results. A nation is its people. And it turns out that more than half of us are either racists or fools. So whichever way you look at it, the referendum was completely illegitimate. So how could I possibly be proud to be British? Well, and now that I find out I'm not, well, I'm absolutely delighted. It turns out I don't share the same DNA as Nigel Farage or Ian Duncan Smith or Jacob Rees-Mogg or Aaron Banks, Dominic Raab. That's got to be something to celebrate. Oh, you notice I don't mention Boris, but he was never a committed Brexiteer. For him, it was just his passport to power. He just wanted to be PM, whatever the cost of the nation. It didn't matter to him if he trashed our economy, our international reputation, all the prospects of millions in the process. And yet people still voted for him. So no, I'm not proud to be British anymore. I'm fucking ashamed. MyAncestry.com provided me with the names and nationalities of my 10 closest relatives on the database. 
Most of them turned out to be Danish with names like Rasmussen and Sorensen and such like. I'm obviously very curious to find out who my real father was, but I don't remember any Danish people in Ainswick when I was growing up, or even now for that matter. I thought about messaging these relatives, but they're mostly third to fifth cousins, so at best we share the same great great grandparents. Still, there's no harm in trying. So I've sent them messages on myancestry.com asking if any of them know if any of their relatives spent any time in the north of England during the 1990s. While I'm waiting to hear back, I decided to have a word with Mum's sister, Auntie Jess. She and Mum have always been close, so if there were any Danes in Mum's circle 25 years ago, she might know about it. Mind you, I had to be careful how I broached the subject. I told little why and why. I said there's a Danish girl on my course and she wanted to know if there were any other Danes in the area. Jess mentioned a local family with a Harlequin Great Dane, so that wasn't much help. Then I asked if there had ever been any Scandinavians in Ainswick to her knowledge. She said she didn't know of any, but there was something about her expression which made me think she knew more than she were letting on. The more I think about it, I really like the idea of being Danish. Even before I discovered my ancestry, I always thought of the Scandinavian countries as sort of ideal societies, socially and politically speaking. Societies other nations could aspire to, and there have been precious few of those at any time in history. One thing I learned in my studies is how history is very little more than a never-ending account of the domination exploitation and extermination of one group of human beings by another. The modern Scandinavian countries are one of the very few bright spots. Politicians endlessly argue about the best ways to organise society, but they don't need to look any further than Denmark or Sweden. For example, did you know that year after year, the Danish are rated the happiest people in the world? despite the awful weather. The reason's obvious when you think about it. In Denmark, the disparity between rich and poor is much smaller than just about anywhere else. For example, in England, CEOs earn about 400 times more than unskilled workers. 400 times. Is it any wonder people feel exploited? In Denmark, the difference is less than four times more. That means they're a hundred times more equal than we are. That is one hell of a difference. There's this saying in Denmark, very few have too much and even fewer have too little. So for a start, it's hardly surprising there's so little crime and well, next to no corruption as well. I think more than anything, happiness comes from being in control of your own life. And it looks like the Danish people feel more empowered because their government actually trusts them. Unlike here, where they treat us like shit and deceive us at every opportunity. Well, let's face it, this country is run by a bunch of spivs and shysters, and they're only in power because of Brexit. At a time of national emergency, when we need a government with integrity and foresight, we're saddled with the least capable and most dishonest government we've had in my lifetime, by a considerable margin. Is it any wonder we've got the world's highest COVID death toll? <laughs> I wouldn't trust this crew to run a corner shop, never mind a nation at a time of crisis. Five of the Danish third cousins wrote back which was nice of them, but only one had any useful information. It's a bit vague, but a Frida Sorensen said she once heard about a distant relative setting up a Danish design shop somewhere in England, so that might be something to go off. There aren't many people I can ask for fear of this getting back to Dad. God knows how he'd react if he knew the truth. I had a word with Mark to see if he has any ideas. 
he reminded me that when we were growing up, there were a lot of Scandinavian things in the house, things like vases and crockery and small items of furniture. Well, they still have some of that stuff. So I went round to mum and dad's house and when they weren't looking, I took some photos. And then I spent hours Googling images of Danish magazine racks and plates and lamps and so on. The only match I could find was the lampshade in the sitting room, which is apparently a Danish design classic. I managed to get the phone number for the importer. And it turns out the nearest shop they supply to is in Manchester. It's called Lavende, which is Danish for living. I googled Lavende and it's owned by a bloke called Gudmund Sorensen. So the same surname as Frida, which is interesting. Oh, I should mention that mum studied at Manchester Uni and she often goes back there to meet friends or even just to go shopping. It's only 45 minutes on the train to Manchester Piccadilly and we don't have many interesting shops here in Ainswick. So, I'm off to Manchester on Saturday. I don't mind admitting I'm actually quite excited. Since getting the DNA results, I've been thinking a lot about identity. Have you ever noticed how we tend to define other people in opposition to ourselves? My friend Helen uses a wheelchair and she complains how able-bodied people always define her by her disability. They're unable to see past it even when they get to know her quite well. But with other wheelchair users, she's just Ellen. Anyway, well, she doesn't like to define herself as disabled because she's actually able to do most of the things that everyone else can. It just takes a little bit more effort and determination. So really, her defining features are a determination and a positive attitude and a sense of humour and a stoicism. <laughs> it's the same when it comes to sexuality. People who identify as straight see me as gay first and foremost. To them, I'm gay Imogen, which is frankly annoying. They have the luxury of being seen as individuals because... Well, being straight is supposedly the norm. The default, like being able-bodied, cisgender or white. But I don't actually see myself as gay. I've had boyfriends in the past. It's just that on balance, I have a preference for women at the moment. Or at least one particular woman. To my mind, bisexual and pansexual are meaningless labels. They imply I could potentially have a relationship with someone who's male or female. Or maybe somewhere in between, but then couldn't we all? Of course, some dunderheads would say, oh, no, I couldn't possibly do that, but they're just lying to themselves, really. If you have an imagination and a modicum of self-knowledge, you know very well it just depends on the circumstances on who you happen to fall in love with. Of course, we have no control over how others define us, but the worst thing is imposing an identity on ourselves. I realise some people gain comfort from labels, especially if you're in a minority, but as soon as you attach a label to yourself, it, it becomes a straitjacket, limiting your horizons and defining yourself within narrow boundaries and in opposition to the rest of society. But how come being British is so important to some people? It's not exactly a minority, is it? Especially if you live here. Let's face it. Nations are no more than artificial constructs, the arbitrary conjunction of history and geography. Just because someone's British, I don't feel any special affinity towards them. Or quite the opposite nowadays. The truth is, I get on better with like-minded foreigners than I do with a high proportion of my own countrymen. 52% of them, to be precise. Since this all... Brexit debate started, I realised my identity as European was far more important to me than my identity as British. Never mind all the practical advantages of being in the EU. And then my European identity was stolen from me by all the morons and bigots who voted for Brexit. But now it looks like there might be a way for me to get my European identity back. 
which is the best news I've had all year. On Saturday, I got the train to Manchester and I met this goodman there in his shop. I called first to make sure he'd be there on the pretext of looking for a Danish lampshade. He's a tall, distinguished, grey-haired man of about 50. He has these frameless glasses and speaks with an accent. But the first thing I notice is how he's definitely got my eyes and my cheekbones. Or to be more precise, I've got his. I'm not sure about the rest of his features because we were both wearing face masks at the time. I pretended to be interested in the things in his shop. It was a mixture of vintage and modern. Everything was Danish, of course. All very nice, but on the expensive side. Then I start asking him about himself. It turns out he's been in Manchester since his mid-twenties and he's originally from somewhere called Odense. Then I mentioned how I thought my mum used to come into his shop and I mentioned her name. <laughs> my God, you should have seen his reaction. He went as white as a sheet and his manner changed completely. He became all very nervous and fidgety. I'm sure there were tears in his eyes, which he tried to cover up by pretending to blow his nose, which is difficult when you're wearing a face mask. He obviously knew exactly who I was, so I decided on the spot to tell him the truth. I told him about the DNA test and about Frida Sorensen and how I thought he might be my father. He said I'd put him in a difficult position and that I'd better speak to my mother about it first. So, to cut a long story short, that's what I've decided to do. When I called Mum, it turned out she already knew I'd been speaking to Goodman and Auntie Jess. We arranged that I'd go round for lunch when Dad was out on the golf course. Mark was invited as well. Mum was obviously embarrassed, but she told us how she and Dad had been trying to have a baby for about four years, ever since they got married. They were having no luck and Dad wasn't at all keen on fertility treatment. He wouldn't even get himself tested. Mum thinks he was afraid they'd find something wrong with his sperm and that would somehow reflect on his virility, on his precious manhood. Knowing Dad, that wouldn't surprise me. Mum was tested and as far as they could tell, there were no reason why she couldn't conceive. Mum suggested IVF. But Dad said it would put too much strain on their marriage. Although he claimed otherwise, Mum thinks he was never that bothered about having kids in the first place. He'd rather be out on the golf course. Well, that figures. Eventually, it got to the point where Mum suggested using a sperm bank. But Dad would have none of it. They had a few rows and then Dad just put his foot down and refused to talk about it. Eventually. Mum decided to go ahead without telling Dad, but instead of using a sperm bank, she approached this Goodman. She'd known him from her time in Manchester, and uh, she'd always pop into his shop when she went back. They'd been quite close friends at one point, and before she met Dad, she went out with him for a while. Anyway, she decided to use him as a sperm donor because, well, he has a lot of good qualities. He's smart and kind and has a good sense of humour, in a Danish sort of way. She's kept him updated about me all the years and uh, apparently he's taken quite an interest. I'm really hoping we're going to be seeing a lot more of each other now. I'm really looking forward to getting to know him. Then there was another big revelation. Mum told us that Mark was also the result of an artificial insemination, but this time from a local bloke in a bridge circle. She would have asked Goodman, but he got married not long after I was born, so he was out of the question. Of course, Mark wants to know all about his biological dad. He's a drama teacher at the local comprehensive, and now Mark wants to meet him as well. In a way, we're both quite pleased about the way things have turned out. But there's no question out of the two of us, I've hit the jackpot with the Danish father. I've applied to the Danish embassy, and Goodman is prepared to write a written statement to the effect that he's my biological dad. That's all I need to become a Danish citizen and effectively rejoin the EU. I'm not actually thinking of going to live there just yet, but it's nice to have the option. No, for the moment at least, my life is here. My friends and family are here. 
my academic life's here. So I just have to stay in this nasty little country for now. <laughs> Let's face it, there are plenty of people who've had to live in places they've come to despise. Go governments that act against everything they've ever believed in, like anyone who values freedom of speech yeah. happens to be born in China or North Korea or values the rule of law but has the misfortune to live in a criminal state like Russia or Somalia or values honesty and decency and had to live under Trump for four years. So I'm far from alone and I'll just have to put up but I'm certainly won't shut up. But I've only one thing to say to Brexiteers. Up yours! Thank you.